Would you believe a large portion of our highway investment is in bridges? A major part of the bridge maintenance problem is bridge deck deterioration. This presentation is to help you understand what the problem is and to describe various repair methods. One has to be wondering, why are we having bridge deck problems? What is causing the problems? Are these problems preventable? How is the best way to repair? The better we can answer these questions, the better job of bridge deck maintenance we can do. The more knowledge we can gain, the better judgments we can make to get the most from our efforts. Not to be pessimistic, but we are fighting a most difficult battle in maintaining bridge decks. Although we start with two perfectly good building materials, concrete and steel, we then subject these materials to every known bug that attacks concrete. Knowing about these bugs provides an appreciation of why bridge decks require continual maintenance attention. But more important, an understanding of why our repair techniques must be the best if our repairs are to survive. First, by suspension between bents and carrying heavy trucks, we bend the deck. Anyone knows concrete does not take kindly to bending. If the concrete survives bending, Let's subject the deck to pounding. By the nature of construction procedures, it is difficult to build a deck as smooth as the adjoining pavement. The expansion joints and irregularities in the deck create pounding and vibration from wheel impacts that normal roadway pavements seldom face. That pounding and bending makes it necessary that all repaired areas have good bonding to the existing concrete. Unfortunately, many bridge decks do not have good drainage. This is either a fault in design or construction resulting in unevenness and low areas, or our own struggle in maintenance in keeping the drains clean. Accumulated debris also forces the deck to absorb moisture. This bug can be kept under control by keeping the drains open, the dirt, cinders, and sand swept, and all repairing done to provide drainage. The moisture bug in itself isn't that bad, but when the moisture carries salt or calcium chloride, this is real trouble. The concrete itself can tolerate chlorides, but salt and steel are two things that you certainly don't want to get together. When salt gets to the steel, you get rust. When you get rust, you can get expansive pressures that crack and spall concrete. This bug is bridge deck enemy number one. We have found that when the salt content reaches two pounds per cubic yard, we can be 95% certain that rusting is taking place. If our bridge deck is still surviving, let's remember that we have the deck suspended in the air so it will be subjected to more freezing than roadway pavements. Of course, this also means more salting. Being exposed on all sides to the air, many freeze-thaw cycles occur many more than with normal roadway pavements. By the same token, we get more heating cycles, which causes more expansion and contraction cycles. There are expansion joints, but they do not always function as intended, which causes stresses in the deck. Also, since reinforcing steel and concrete have different coefficients of expansion, heat causes additional stress in the concrete deck. Another significant bug, the inconsistent mix in the concrete. Even when starting with a good mix, as concrete is strained through closely spaced heavy reinforcing steel, segregation occurs, water pockets develop, and weakened areas and planes result. These weakened areas often become potholes. Being faced with this many bugs, we shouldn't be surprised when potholes develop. In fact, we may be surprised that bridge decks survive as well as they do. The point is, bridge decks catch the worst abuse possible, and anything less than a good repair has little or no chance of success. Using Missouri's repair costs with 1977 as the base year, we can see that expenditures through 1979 for bridge deck maintenance have more than doubled 
since 1974. The sharp increases in years 1975 and 1979 were largely due to inflation. Increases in 1976, 1977, and 1978 were due to increased deck deterioration. The figure used to compute the percentage includes all deck repairs and also surface treatments of linseed oil and sealing. These rising costs are an indication of things to come. Looking ahead, we must find ways of stemming this mushrooming of repair costs. This is one of the prime reasons for this presentation. The rapidly increasing need for repairs is evident if we stop to consider the combination of several things. One is the increase in the use of salt over the years as shown by the figures compiled in Missouri. Of particular significance is that Missouri began continuous treatment with chemicals in about 1969. Two, the number of concrete bridge decks increased as many new bridges were built during the early 60s and are now in excess of 15 years old. Many of these bridges are reaching the rehabilitation or replacement stage. Many of these bridges are on high traffic interstates and will be very difficult and expensive to rehabilitate. Now add the fact that less money is now available to replace worn out bridge decks, which means we will have to get more service life out of the existing deck. We are also faced with heavier and more frequent truck loadings. The result of these factors has to be an increased need for repairs, not less, in the years to come. At this point, let's review three major categories of bridge deck deterioration. Scaling, cracking, spalling. Scaling could be defined as the flaking off of concrete from the surface. This is an example of scaling. One of the brighter spots on bridge deck maintenance is that this is one aspect that we have about whipped. The use of air entrained concrete has resulted in less scaling caused by freezing and thawing forces. Linseed oil and other sealer treatments also help. Surface drainage is very important in reducing scaling. Cracking is the next listed category. There are a number of different types of cracking. However, the transverse crack, which generally occurs over the reinforcing steel, causes the major problems. However, any crack allows water and easy access to the steel, which rusts and further cracks the concrete above. Spalling is the deterioration of concrete that has broken loose, usually at the top of the reinforcing steel. Left unrepaired, the area grows larger and larger due to exposure to salt and moisture and magnified tire pounding. In order to combat bridge deck deterioration through the life of the deck, we battle through three stages. First, our efforts are to prevent deterioration. Then when we lose that one, we begin fighting the deterioration by patching holes as they come. Then eventually we will lose the battle and have to rebuild the bridge deck. How soon this happens depends on how well we did in the prevent stage and the fight stage. Some say this stage is reached when 30 to 40% of the deck is deteriorated. Before we get to the fight stage, let's review what we're doing in the prevent stage. The prevent stage involves three tactics to reduce salt and moisture penetration into the deck. One, good surface drainage. Two, linseed oil treatment. There are other surface sealer treatments available and in use. Three, seal coating. These should be performed by maintenance forces on a routine basis. Let's discuss these in more detail. Surface drainage. Much attention has been given to surface drainage, both in design and construction. Prolonged wetness is obviously detrimental for the reasons discussed earlier. 
Constant maintenance attention is necessary to prevent water being contained on the deck through blocked drains or accumulation of dirt, cinders, and so forth that prolong the drying of the floor. Bridge decks, therefore, should be swept and flushed as necessary to allow water to leave the deck. Linseed oil treatment. Linseed oil treatment is done for waterproofing and is intended to reduce damage from salt are other surface sealers available and in use. If linseed oil treatment is used, five hundredths of a gallon per square yard of a mixture of 50% linseed oil and 50% mineral spirits is applied to the newly constructed deck. A second application should be made the next year using approximately four hundredths of a gallon per square yard of the mixture shot on the deck with a distributor, usually in hot weather. On decks with dense concrete riding surfaces, the application rate should not exceed four hundredths of a gallon per square yard. Seal coats. Where traffic volumes will permit and where deterioration is not advanced and the deck is not uneven, an asphaltic seal coat is sometimes used to reduce deck wear and slow down the penetration of salt. If it is decided that a seal coat is the proper treatment, then a penetration asphalt should be used along with a hardcover aggregate such as trap rock. RC 3000 asphalt could be used on low traffic bridges. When the seal is placed under traffic, it is important to keep traffic off of the seal until cured sufficiently to retain the cover aggregate. This is particularly critical on high volume roads. Where the deck is uneven or the deterioration is advanced, a bituminous mat might be laid. However, a bituminous mat will absorb moisture and should be used only as an interim solution. A concrete overlay is another solution for a deck that is heavily patched and uneven. Special concrete, such as Dow latex, can be used to stop deterioration and provide good drainage. These items are normally not done by routine maintenance. Even with the most diligent prevent measures, we will still have deteriorated areas in bridge decks that will have to be repaired. There are two basic methods of repair, temporary and permanent. We should strive to make permanent repairs when possible. However, during periods of cold, wet weather, Holes are most likely to develop, and repairs should be made, even if only temporary. Temporary repairs are usually made with some kind of bituminous material. This may be a hot commercial asphaltic concrete mix or some kind of previously prepared cold mix. There are several cold weather patch materials, such as Silvax, Blackcrete, Saturac and so forth that give satisfactory results. Regardless of the material used, excess water should be removed from the hole and the hole primed with hot liquid asphalt or other suitable primer. Permanent patching materials. Where traffic volumes are such that a lane can be closed for adequate curing periods, regular concrete can be used as a patching material. Where traffic volumes will permit an overnight lane closure, some states are using low slump concrete with high early strength cement. For patching decks, where peak traffic volumes will not allow lane closures, there are these types of materials available. Early strength cement, accelerated concrete, and low viscosity epoxy. Early strength cement, Duracal, for example. A cement that is a mixture of gypsum and Portland cement with other additives that sets fast. Accelerated concrete. A liquid accelerator added to concrete at the time of the mixing. Low viscosity epoxy. A two compound epoxy resin material when mixed with a fine aggregate, sand, produces a high strength material. These materials are all good, but the results will depend on workmanship. 
Let's discuss the quick setting materials in more detail. Early strength cement. The big advantage of using an early strength cement in bridge deck patching is that it allows the repairs to be made quickly and the bridge open to traffic sooner than with regular concrete. Compressive strength of 700 PSI at two hours can be achieved. Temperature changes do not affect the set time as much and a lower shrinkage occurs with early strength cement compared to chemically accelerated concrete. The disadvantages are higher material costs, higher susceptibility to scaling and abrasion, lower bonding strength, and higher allowable penetration of salt than with regular concrete. Duracal is an early strength cement that can be premixed bagged and used with predictable results. Accelerated concrete. For years we have obtained a fast setting concrete by adding accelerators such as Sika set to a normal concrete premix. This method still has several advantages. The material, if produced correctly, makes a durable patch and the ultimate strength is higher than material such as Duracrete. You can also vary the setting time by varying the amount of accelerator. But there are some disadvantages. One is the influence of temperature on setting times. Another is the additional step involved since you must add the accelerator and the proportioning is somewhat critical. In cold temperatures, you must heat the water or aggregate. Also, the patches tend to shrink, causing cracks. Epoxy mortar. Epoxy mortar is the only material that has the strength and bonding to work satisfactorily in shallow patches, those patches one inch or less in depth. The cost is very high. Your mix of epoxy and sand must be just right or either the patch shrinks and cracks if too rich, or is too porous if too lean. Handling the chemicals can be hazardous and tools must be carefully and quickly cleaned. Let's review the individual materials available for use in the units in which the material is normally supplied. Concrete bonding compound, 10 gallon units, is used in conjunction with accelerated concrete and is usually painted on the vertical sides of the hole. The purpose is simply one of better adhesion to the existing concrete. Sicadur Heimod or Metabond GP are examples of bonding compound. Concrete accelerators, 55 gallon units, such as Sika Set C, are added to a concrete mix to accelerate the cure time. Low viscosity epoxy, 165 gallon units, is for thin mortar patches. The epoxy comes in two parts and is mixed with sand. Colmador and Metacrete are examples. Concrete damp proofing, 55 gallon units, is used on the concrete patch as a prime where bituminous material must be replaced. Sika Seal and Plaster Bond 232 are examples. Premix aggregate, 90 pound bag, sand and cement are purchased in bags for convenience. Concrete accelerator must be added to the mix. Fast set or early strength cement concrete mixes such as Duracrete are usually bagged in 90 pound bags and need only have water added at the time of use. We have discussed permanent patching and the materials to be used. Now let's discuss what to patch. This is an example of early deterioration in the concrete deck which has advanced such that it is reflected through the asphaltic concrete overlay. It is evident by the cement particles which are carried in solution with water and percolated through the reflective crack. At this stage, it would reflect a deteriorated area in the underlying concrete. If not repaired, the area will quickly become a spalled area. If the spalled area is left unrepaired, it will become a full depth hole. 
The full depth hole requires forming placed under the deck and is very expensive and time consuming to repair. Therefore, early repairs to deteriorated areas should be made. This requires sounding with a hammer or other method on the concrete deck to determine the area to be broken out. On asphalt overlays, you may need to do some guessing, but sounding will give a fairly accurate determination. It is very important that we repair the fractured area as well as the pothole. If we don't repair the adjacent loose concrete, we will soon be back. A double check to listening for hollow sounds is to place small rocks on the surface. If the rocks bounce when you hammer, the concrete is fractured. A discerning eye can pick this up while using a jackhammer. Where the stones bounce, you need to break out. An iron rod will also give good results and is easier. You don't have to get on your hands and knees. The area to be removed should be marked. Note the chalk marks. Regardless of the method used to sound the deck, it is very important that we remove all of the deteriorated concrete prior to placing patch material. After removal, we found moisture-saturated concrete remaining. If we don't remove this, the existing concrete will deteriorate much faster as a result of the patching. The area to be removed should first be cut with a saw in order to reduce the loosening of adjacent concrete. On a deck with an asphalt overlay, we should cut the overlay wider than the area of concrete anticipated to be removed such that the fresh concrete can be struck off flush. The overlay could then be squared for better compaction and appearance. We have sounded the area, saw cut, and have begun to remove the old concrete. See anything hazardous? Let's inject some safety reminders. Use the metal tow guards. Also, use the other safety equipment that is available. Especially use safety goggles when sandblasting and cleaning with air. Always be on the alert for efficient work scheduling. An example would be sawing the next day's holes while you are waiting for patches to cure prior to opening to traffic. This gives you a jump on longer curing times and quantity of holes you can fix in a day. Incidentally, Square up patches better than the one on the right. In most cases, this should be one large patch due to the likelihood of a horizontal fracture being present or developing during removal operations. When sawing, finish your corners like this. Don't saw past the corner. This could soon spall out. A light hammer. 30 PSI to 55 PSI will allow removal below the steel with less tendency to break through the deck. Don't vibrate the rebars any more than you can help. Keep the jackhammer bit off the rebar. Not only will the chisel cut a bar, but at the very least it will break the bar loose from the surrounding concrete. A man pulling the loose material out of the way gives the jackhammer operator a clear view of what he is chipping gets the loose material out of the way. This increases his production. A brooming gets the larger particles out, and a cleaning by compressed air gets the remaining loose material that the broom can't get. Where possible, blow the sand away from oncoming traffic. Before concluding that you are ready to pour concrete, look for the little things that might cause trouble. For instance, here we didn't get all of the spalled area. Here we still have loose concrete that we didn't finish breaking loose and removing. Here what probably caused the spall was the high steel caused by the bar end sticking up. Get a sledgehammer and knock them down before covering with concrete. This is hard on the adjacent concrete, but is preferable to leaving the steel high. The high steel may be cut with a torch where structural integrity is not involved. 
Here is one of our most unfavorite problems. A Sonovoid II bridge deck, and we have broken through. We have to get out the loose concrete and wire up some kind of form. This is a good point to discuss equipment. If correctly equipped, we can do a good job efficiently. If not properly equipped, we will be much less efficient. Ideally, we have a van truck that carries our tools, signs, and so forth. In this case, we pull our air compressor with this truck. In this truck, a generator is needed. And a sandblast unit. We will discuss sandblasting later. An adequate concrete mixer is needed. Or a concrete mobile may be used truck to carry materials and to carry water. Also a third truck to haul the broken concrete and to haul hot mix if you must replace an asphalt overlay. This truck can also transport your flashing aero trailer or your concrete saw if pulled on a trailer. This is a list of the needed major equipment. We may not always be able to provide all of this but this equipment is desirable. Too small a mixer such as this leads to inconsistent mixes as well as slows your work. Not enough trucks and material will perhaps get dumped to make room for broken concrete and so forth. The point is we have a big job to do and we may as well get properly equipped. With materials containing fast set cement the mixing and placing of concrete is not too difficult. With admixture accelerated concrete, there is slightly more procedure. First, with materials such as Duracrete. Add one gallon of water per bag. Don't use too much water. This concrete has the desirable consistency. Don't forget to pre-wet the hole. Wet curing of the concrete is preferable. However, if the material does not give off a lot of heat, a membrane cure is satisfactory. If asphalt is to be placed over the patch, the liquid asphalt tack can serve as the curing membrane. Work the concrete with your shovel to eliminate voids and work the concrete around and under the rebars. Your setting time is as short as 15 minutes so you can't waste time getting the mix in place and finishing. Do your finishing work as soon as possible and don't overwork. If you continue working after the concrete takes its initial set, you will damage the surface. If the patch is large, use a straight board to strike off. If you don't, the patch will not be level. If you don't have an asphalt surface, your work is completed at this point. Let cure at least two hours and you should have concrete adequate for traffic use. Don't forget that materials such as Duracrete also set up fast and hard on your tools. Keep them in water or clean. If you have an asphaltic overlay, your patch prior to replacing the asphaltic layer should resemble this. Incidentally, Never replace with concrete to any higher level than the original concrete. Sooner or later, the asphalt layer will probably have to be removed for a resurfacing. Concrete patches protruding above the original deck surface will get you some unkind thoughts from the mortar grader or loader operator trying to scrape the old resurfacing loose. The first step is to paint the area with a prime. Usually seek a seal, Plaster Bond 232 or liquid asphalt. You must seal out as much water as possible and get the best possible bonding of the asphalt to the concrete. Now replace the asphalt. The hot mix should be kept hot prior to laying wherever possible. Now, some good judgment from you on how much material to scoop into the hole. 
last thing we need is for the resulting patch to create a bump or depression which would create impact loading on the floor. Use a rake to uniformly distribute and level the material without segregating the material. As is always good practice, keep your tools clean, such as the man is doing with his shovel. You must compact the asphalt, and the best way is with a vibratory compactor. At the very least, use a hand tamper. If you can permit the asphalt to cool before turning traffic loose, so much the better. When compacted, the asphalt should be slightly higher, an eighth of an inch or less, than the adjacent pavement. Some compaction will continue to take place, and we don't want a water pocket. This patch is too high and will result in a bump. Coating the edge of the bituminous patch with the material used to prime the hole is a worthwhile extra touch. Don't do this on a concrete patch if there is no asphaltic resurfacing. This is the finished product. Level, smooth, square, and hopefully there to stay a while. Epoxy. Often we have patches that are too thin for the use of concrete, a patch that will be one inch or less in depth. This could be spalled areas, crack repairs, and so forth. Then we must use epoxy. Epoxy mortar repairs must be kept to a minimum since epoxy is expensive, and also the mixes must be exacting to give good results. If there is one place where good workmanship is necessary for good results, it certainly is with epoxy patching. First, let's review the general steps, and then we will go through in detail a field operation. One, maximum depth of one inch. Two, square edges of hole. Three, sandblast hole. Four, prime entire hole. Five, proportion sand and epoxy correctly. Six, seal edges of hole. First, we need a hole that is reasonably square. Epoxy patches, if done right, don't require sawed holes. But doing it right requires clean, dry holes. This means sandblasting the hole. If you don't, you may have surfaces such as this where mud and moisture will prevent good bonding. Then the area must be cleaned with an air nozzle. This is to eliminate the dust, sand, and moisture in order to develop good bond. Epoxy is a two-component product. Purchased in 55-gallon drums, you will undoubtedly want to transfer to five-gallon buckets when transporting to the field. Be sure you mark and know which is A and which is B. Two parts A are proportioned with one part B. Notice the paper buckets. Throwaway containers are cheaper as solvent to clean metal buckets costs more and time in cleaning up is saved. A mechanical method of mixing is almost a necessity if a significant quantity is to be used. A low speed, 400 to 600 RPM drill is needed. Mix the two components until the blend is uniform in color, which is usually about three minutes. Keep your equipment clean. This requires placing in a cleaner immediately after use. Incidentally, if the worst happens and epoxy hardens on your tools, heat the tool and the epoxy should pop off. Cleaners specifically for epoxy are needed. This happens to be one that Sika manufactures. With this blended material, paint the entire surface of the hole. Include coating the steel. The hole should look like this before placing the mix. Don't leave puddles in the bottom of the hole. On the other hand, the entire surface must be coated. No dry areas. If you do, the excess will bleed out, as shown here. 
The patch will look messy, the bonding will not be as good, and curing times may not be as dependable. Besides, you're wasting material. Now, the mixing with sand. A well-graded dry sand must be used. A silica sand, as shown here, is probably best. This is where workmanship, again, is important. Without the right mix, your patch will probably fail. The tendency is probably to use too little sand with the epoxy. It mixes easier that way, also sets up faster. But don't use too rich a mix. At one epoxy to four sand, we lose the shininess and we think we have the best mix. It is economical and we obtain a good waterproof patch. After the composition is selected, we are ready to mix. Mixing mechanically is almost a necessity. Add sand to epoxy as you are mixing, not epoxy to the sand. A standard mortar mixer can be used for large quantities. Needless to say, you must mix thoroughly. Get the mixed material in the hole as soon as possible. With a well-organized crew, as shown here, this work can actually proceed quite quickly. We are priming, mixing, and laying simultaneously. The mix goes quickly on the prime, and the material goes immediately in the hole after being mixed. Work the material to eliminate any voids and get some compaction. Strike the patch off. You must keep your tools clean. Epoxy sets quickly and permanently on equipment. A dirty trowel or float will not give you a satisfactory surface. Seal the edges as shown here, and you're finished. The perfect patch. And then, as never fails, someone has to step in it. Many of the epoxies are somewhat hazardous to use. For safe handling and use, careful review of the manufacturer's recommendations should be made prior to use. Generally, in large urban areas, we have more bridge deck patching than we can get done. We also have traffic handling problems. For our benefit and the traveling public's, we should, where possible, avoid having lanes closed during peak usage. We should also take advantage of directional flow and work in the direction of lighter traffic. Once you are in a high traffic, short work period situation, make sure your size of crew is right and you eliminate all foreseeable delays. Let's review our traffic control requirements for closing a lane on divided pavement. This is one state's standard. In the field, the signing looks something like this. First, the bridge work ahead. The right lane closed ahead signing. The right lane closed 1,000 feet sign. Then the flagman ahead sign. Next, proper coning of a taper. At least a 660 foot length of taper for 55 mile per hour speed and 12 foot lane. The cones should be set on a uniform taper. The flashing arrow is not required, but is certainly advantageous. When used, the flashing arrow should be placed at the point of the taper. Note the flagman and protective truck at the bridge. Park that truck at least 150 feet from the crew. The flagman is very important. Your life can depend on him. Follow these rules. We have covered a number of bridge deck problems and repair procedures. Sometimes things look a little dismal. Perhaps we need to bow our heads and ask for guidance when there appears to be no way we can handle the problem. 
there is always an answer as to what we can do with it. This is not an acceptable course of action, regardless of what you sometimes wish you could do. May all of your bridges be this nice to view and never cause you any deck problems.